In the spring of 1879, the posse arrived in Coldwater Creek, Colorado. They were a motley assortment. Gabriel Pryor, real name Edmund Fletcher, the silver-tongued con man to whom nothing was sacred save the woman he loved. That would be Rosaline Byrne, Irish immigrant, high-class escort, knife fighter, and secretly a huckster, plying arcane arts. James Bogue, the cautious and steely gunslinger who had long ago vowed to take down the shadowy baron who had razed to the ground a town that Bogue was supposed to have protected. And Tortlaw, a Native American shaman who had a deep love for the natural world, but a curious way of abandoning her friends when they were in need. They came to Coldwater Creek because Gabriel had, under false pretenses, answered a call for a new town preacher. Seems their last one had up and left town one night, not altogether uncommon. Why, not six months earlier, a team of miners had disappeared while investigating some strangeness in the newly discovered Ghost Rock mine responsible for Coldwater Creek's recent boom. It happens. The posse immediately ran afoul of a local outfit calling themselves the Holbrook Gang, who made the mistake of trying to rob the stage that our heroes were riding into town. The posse trounced them soundly and arrived in town as heroes. No sooner had they begun to settle in and ignore the sourceless whispers in the church than the Holbrook Gang rode into town, led by the quick-tempered Johnny Carrington, who set fire to the new schoolhouse and demanded the posse be left tied up outside of town the next day. A stray bullet from the outlaws struck a man in the crowd, who ran off behind a building and seemingly exploded. There was no time to look into that, though, as the town's marshal began calling for the posse's heads. Gabriel's silver tongue was able to sway the townsfolk to his side, much to Marshal Hurlis's chagrin, and the posse followed the Holbrook gang and caught them unawares during the night, capturing Johnny and bringing him back to face justice. So it was that the posse got off to a great start with most of the people of Coldwater Creek, and a rocky start with some others. Along the way, they encountered Texas Ranger Esther Wynn, who turned out to be an old friend of James Bogues and was responsible for getting him deputized by the marshal. She also urged him to look closer at the goings-on in town and warned him off the trail of the Baron, intimating that it might bring him into conflict with the Texas Rangers. The group attempted to settle in, but were beset with strangeness everywhere they turned. Spooky visions in the church, a rogue automaton created by a mad scientist and his assistant, who immediately got on Gabe's bad side, and vice versa. A shady card sharp by the name of Zachary Driscoll, who was the right-hand man of the local mining magnate. Monsters that exploded out of people. It was in the course of investigating the latter that they came in contact with Howell Melton and his wife Ludie. Ludie had actually seen something explode out of that unfortunate man from the night the Holbrook gang demanded blood, and Howell journeyed with the posse for a short time to help them get to the bottom of things, though he thought it all hogwash, to be honest. And all the while, Rosaline and Gabriel worked their con on the town. The false preacher even ran church services, and his words seemed to have a curiously strong effect on the townsfolk. James continued to sniff out leads as to the whereabouts of the Baron, and Tortlaw, well, she was around as well. And just when it seemed things had quieted a bit, Johnny Carrington was explosively freed from jail and the Texas Ranger was grievously wounded during her pursuit of the criminals. She was only able to warn the posse that Colt Holbrook was coming before she lost consciousness. The posse scarcely had time to rally a handful of townsfolk to their side before Holbrook did indeed arrive, a flamethrower on his back, ranting about dark whispers and the assured victory of his hidden allies no matter the outcome of the day. The battle was ferocious. Buildings were burned, good people were killed, and also the entirety of the elderly bullet gang. But in the end, Johnny Carrington got a blow dart through the eye and Colt Holbrook had his throat cut. The posse had saved Coldwater Creek, or so it seemed. The summer months passed and lulled them into complacency, but all was not well. A secretive group calling themselves the Scions of Athena had taken to posting unsettling flyers on the church. James's ranging was taking him further afield, but still he had found no sign of his quarry. Rosaline was having nightmares and seeing strange things in the dark of the night and Gabe decided to test his powers of persuasion over his flock, 
and discovered he may have accidentally been compelling his friends to do things against their will. There were also strange rumors that were floating through the town. A drunk claimed to have seen Colt Holbrook in the woods one night, and there was talk of a new railhead to be built in Coldwater Creek that brought agents of both the Black River and Union Blue rail lines to town. James had left searching for answers, and the posse got mixed up in the rail lines conflict, ending up on the bad side of both railways and nearly losing their lives to boot. During this time, Gabriel was asked to perform burial rites on a family that had been horribly murdered, and he began to question his actions in Coldwater Creek. At the urging of a kind and well-dressed gentleman named Gerald Richards, who seemed aware of Gabriel's hold over the church congregation, Gabriel decided to urge the townsfolk to help one another and see if he could bring a little good into the world. Meanwhile, James had run afoul of what seemed to be two separate groups of bandits prowling around the outskirts of Coldwater Creek and was bested by a shadowy figure who seemed to know him, mocking him as he sent James riding back to town. Rosaline had been finding mysterious pages from a menacing children's story about a dark entity called Jack O'Nines, and the children of Coldwater Creek were acting strangely as well. With mining magnate Carlton Harris returning to town, things seemed to be reaching a boiling point, and Gabriel's sermon tipped it over the edge. Seems the good people took his words a bit too literally, and took it upon themselves to help their neighbors, whether the help was wanted or not. Things took a turn for the violent, and Tortlaw vanished in the chaos of that strange night before the posse was able to save the town from themselves. Not long after, the posse again ran across Howell Melton, who was much the worse for wear having run himself ragged searching for Ludie. Seems she had started having some kind of visions after witnessing that man explode, and an unknown group had abducted her and left Howell for dead after burning down his home. Since the posse were the most capable group around, Howell decided to throw his lot in with them for the time being. Gerald Richards reappeared and tried to help get to the bottom of what had gone so wrong with the false preacher's sermon, but he was rebuffed by a furious Gabriel and the suspicious posse members. And then there was that embarrassing incident wherein the group was almost eviscerated by undead squirrels. Best not to dwell on that. Their luck continued to sour, though, as they were led into an ambush. It seems neither Colt Holbrook nor Johnny Carrington were as dead as had been thought, but they were changed somehow, bearing the grisly wounds of their deaths upon their pallid bodies, and they were possessed of new strengths and abilities. They had also captured Tortlaw and aimed to end her life as well as the rest of the posses. They might have done it, too, were it not for the timely intervention of two native shamans from Tortlaw's past who rescued the posse and healed their injuries. The respite was short-lived, however, as the shamans revealed that the world was not as it seemed. They were in the midst of something called the Reckoning. Evil spirits called Manitou had been released from their otherworldly prison and were spreading fear, both to feed the Reckoners, their dark masters, and to transform the land itself into a hellish dead land. And worst of all, the posse were a part of this somehow, though the shamans weren't sure why. The cryptic natives merely insisted that the wind whispered their names. They then left on their own quest, taking Tortlaw with them and leaving the posse to puzzle things out for themselves. A dark tide was rising against the group. Jack O'Nines, the malevolent spirit who had been haunting Rosaline, finally confronted the posse, but they were able to defeat him and save the town's children. And the Scions of Athena were working to turn the town against the group, but before their scheming could come to fruition, a mysterious trail of posed corpses that no one else seemed to be able to see led our intrepid heroes deep into the ghost rock mines below Coldwater Creek. Some twisted power trapped them there and began to chisel away at their sanity, and they finally came face to face with their tormentor, Gerald Richards. Or at least, that's what he called himself. But his pleasant and well-dressed visage was merely a mask. This was chaos eldest brother of the Reckoners, who had been trapped long ago beneath the ground of what was now Coldwater Creek, and who was a touch miffed that his siblings had begun the reckoning without him. Chaos proved to be a being of unimaginable power, but he didn't seem to want to kill the posse. In fact, he offered them a deal. Persuasive power for Gabriel, magical knowledge for Rosaline, 
the name and location of the Baron for James, and the whereabouts of Howell's wife, Ludie. All of this he would give to them in exchange for Gabriel becoming the servitor of chaos and the posse going forth and acting in his name. If they didn't agree to his terms, he promised to kill them and raise the town to the ground. Seeing no other choice, the group was about to accept his offer, foolishly and predictably believing themselves to be a match for chaos and planning to turn against him at the earliest opportunity, when Gabriel was unexpectedly chosen, called into the service of a seemingly benevolent higher power. This allowed the posse to escape the mine, but Chaos proved a man of his word, as he forced the inhabitants of the town to turn on each other, killing and maiming and tearing, feeding off their delicious fear even as he used them as a mouthpiece to swear to the posse that he would find them. He would follow them. He would kill them. And so they fled on the airship of a traveling salesman, watching from above as the town of Coldwater Creek was swallowed by the earth and consumed by fire and madness. And now they're in Denver. Have been for a month or so. I expected them to be smarter than this, and I must admit, I was surprised to discover that they had stayed so near. Perhaps they didn't learn as much from our little encounter as I thought. Or maybe they're just idiots. In any case, I know exactly where they are. And my machinations are only beginning. And you, sitting there, listening to this, might be tempted to warn them. But you can't. You're too far removed, by time and by dimension, to warn them of the fate that awaits them. You can only watch and hope, and wish them luck. They're going to need it.